Thank you, Anton and Ricky, for leading us so well. Before we jump in uh, to the sermon, a couple things. Just first of all, let me say to you, all of you, thank you for showing up, for being here. I know it's kind of a pain uh, to get to church these days. You have to register ahead of time. You have to walk through that wind tunnel from the parking lot. You have to wear a mask, and, and, I, and I understand all of that. And I, it's just good to be together. So thanks for making those sacrifices. We're trusting God that he's brought us this far. I mean, I know you don't even get to sit in your usual spot sometimes. Somebody has to seat you. But it's putting to the test. Do we care enough to be together and want to be together? And so we're grateful that you're here. I'm personally grateful that you're here. And looking forward, as God brings us as a church family across all of our campuses and all of our services, slowly regathering indoors back to a, a place where, where we really can experience the, the fullness of the family of God again. So thanks for being part of that. I'm grateful you're here. Second, uh, in case you've been living under a rock or in a snow cave or something, we have an election coming up in two days. Anybody unaware of that? I think we're all, we're all weary and ready uh, to have that behind us. But I think it'd be appropriate for us just to take a moment before we jump into the sermon uh, to pray. To pray for what's coming in two days and to pray for our nation and uh, pray for the church in the midst of this as well. So will you join me? Let's pray together. Father God, we've been singing your praises and turning our hearts, or at least trying to, toward you. And we acknowledge in this moment that you're God and there's no other God. We acknowledge your sovereign control over all things, including our nation and a presidential election. We confess that we are experiencing fear and anxiety individually and as a nation. But you are greater than those things that come against us. We love you, Lord, and we believe that what you say is true and it can be depended on. We repent of not loving you and not loving our neighbor as we should. We seek your forgiveness and your wise counsel, not just in this pre-election moment, but at all times. We do pray for this coming election and ask for peace, for safety, for your guidance. We declare you are our peace, Lord. We seek your will, not our own, knowing that all things work together for our good and your glory because we are called and loved by you. We thank you for the freedom and the privilege we have in this country, and we ask for your wisdom as we exercise our duty as citizens. We acknowledge that the government rests on your shoulders, Lord. We declare that you, as our sovereign God and loving Father, know all things. We know that we're first citizens of your kingdom and your righteousness. We put our trust in you alone. We pray, Lord, that you would turn the hearts of your people back to you across this land. We pray that, you will be, that your will would be done. And we ask these things, not with fear, but with confidence and assurance, knowing that you hear and listen and answer. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, our Savior, our King, and our Redeemer. Amen. Okay, we're wrapping up a series called Choosing Joy, uh, Paul's Letter to the Philippians. If you've been with us, uh, you, if you haven't been, you can tune in uh, and go back and listen to the sermons you may have missed. But we finished the series now, we've been in, and looking at what Paul's theme of joy. Wrote this letter to the church in Philippi, which is in Macedonia. Many of these believers he knew personally, some he led to faith in Christ, helped plant this church. He's now in prison, chained to a Roman guard, and writes a letter to them, the, the, the overarching theme of which is joy missed his dire circumstances, and theirs as well. And it's very relevant for us. So in order to jump in, I want to ask you a question, because the passage we're going to look at, at least one verse, will be very familiar to all of you. What's the most well-known verse in all the Bible? Anybody? John 3.16. Has to be, right? Most of us would say that. Maybe Genesis 1.1 is in the running. In the beginning, God did something, right? Or John 11.35, the shortest verse in all the Bible. Anybody know it? Jesus wept. I used to memorize that one. If you've never memorized the verse before, now you have. Psalm 23, 1 might be up there. The Lord is my shepherd. Mm, whatever else comes next, I know that much, right? But I think Philippians 4, 13, which is in the middle of this passage we're going to examine, is certainly one of the most well-known in our contemporary culture today. Um, we see it all the time. It's the phrase, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And it's made popular, especially in professional sports today, isn't it? Tim Tebow, most recently, with his eye black, you'll see it on the screen here. He looks like he could do all things. Philippians 4.13, right there under his eyes. What if he, just, what if he lost his left eye black? He just said, Phil. <laughs> I think that'd be funny. Of course, uh, Steph Curry uh, writes it on his shoes before uh, games. He puts it on his shoes as well. It says, I can do all things, dot, dot, dot. But dot, dot, dot's pretty important. We'll get to that. And when I was younger, I used to like to watch heavyweight boxing, and Evander Holyfield, the real deal Holyfield, used to put it on the back of his robe. And he, in fact, he wore it on his robe the night he, not, he beat Mike Tyson. 
And I thought, wow, Mike Tyson was considered unbeatable. You are the real deal, Evander. You can do all things. He even writes it on his glove to this day. If you get his autograph, he puts it on his glove. But then he also wore that same robe with the same reference to the night he got beat by Lennox Lewis. So I don't know if he could do all things. What does it mean? We see it everywhere. Many people know the verse. Very few know the context. And I think while it might be in the top ten of most well-known verses, it's certainly, in my view, number one or two in most misapplied and misunderstood verses. So let's look at Philippians 4, 10 through 13. You can turn your Bibles if you have them or follow on the screen. We'll read this, this passage. Paul's writing here. I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at length you have revived your concern for me. You were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. Not that I'm speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound in any and every circumstance. I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. It sounds a bit different there, doesn't it? Not win a heavyweight title, not win an NBA championship, not win a Heisman Trophy, but I can, I can learn how to be, trust God in all situations. There's a sense in which all of chapter 4 that Paul writes here is kind of in a glorified thank you letter. He, you, you see it uh, throughout this, the, the letter, but particularly in chapter 4, he's thanking the Philippians for their concern for him, for their provision of, of, for his needs, for their care for him, for their partnership in the gospel. And he loves them, and they clearly care deeply for him. And they've made sacrifices to help him. But it's interesting to me that in this letter, Paul's closing and his closing words emphasize this, this subject of contentment. He must think it's pretty important for them and for us to be content. Contentment is an interesting idea, our relationship to material possessions and our sense of what matters and our, our sense of peace. A friend of my dad is an airline pilot. When I was growing up, I remember him telling the story that he used to, when he was a little kid, he would be fishing in their local pond, and he would always look up and see planes flying overhead and, and dream of someday being a pilot. Then he said when he became a pilot, he would fly, and as he was coming in, he would fly over these, this neighborhood with ponds, uh, and he would always wish he was a little kid fishing again. We don't seem to be content. America may be the land of the free, but it's not the home of the content. Uh, the lack of contentment marks our nation and our culture and our existence in the suburbs, certainly. We see it in our high rate of consumer debt. We see it in the mobility. People are transient, moving from job to job, house to house, always looking for, it just might be better if I could just get a little more square footage, just get a little bit more income, if I could just get to this point. We feel like it's the ever-receding horizon. You ever drive across, right, eastern Colorado, western Nebraska, like it goes on forever, just the horizon always out there. You never get there, it feels like. Sometimes it can feel like that in our life. Just the, ever, the horizon's always out there. We're never, if I could just get... A lack of contentment. I, I've experienced that. So Paul writes to these Philippian Christians about the secret of contentment. And he's talking about a relationship to stuff, to things, to comfort. How do you, what's your relationship to comfort and material possessions and, and security financially? For some of us, it's uh, indulgence. You ever watch the show Parks and Rec? Tom Haverford and Donna have this little, I think they have a little day a year called Treat Yourself. Treat Yourself, my daughter and my, my wife have a little Treat Yourself day. Meaning self-indulgence. My relationship to things is I just indulge in them because they're there for, for my enjoyment. Others, it's deprivation. It's self-denial. I don't need those things. Or simplification. We have shows about this, right, to simplify our lives. Or for some, it's detachment. This was the view of the Greek Stoic philosophers, which were very influential still in Paul's day, which is you need to be detached and, and from the need for these things. But from a biblical perspective, none of these approaches are really what contentment is. So what is contentment? Well, there's lots of ways we could say it or define it or describe it, but I think this little definition will be very helpful, at least it is to me, as we go forward. Contentment is... Living free from the lie that having more makes you more. Contentment is living free from this notion that if I had more, if I had more retirement, if I had a better job, if I had a better house, if I had a better relationship, if, if I had this, I, I would be more significant, I'd be more at peace, I'd be more. Contentment is really not our natural state as human beings, is it? At least that's not my observation and not my experience in my life. We are naturally discontented people. Augustine, St. Augustine made this popular in his confessions when he said, 
Thou hast made us for our, th thyself, O Lord, but our hearts are restless, or you could say discontented, until we find our rest or contentment in thee. That's the natural human state. Think about the, 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 it goes all the way back to the story of Genesis. This is not just a contemporary modern problem in our world. Think about the story of Genesis. God made Adam and Eve, and he created all of creation for them in a beautiful garden in which they were to experience the fulfillment and joy of relationship with him. Everything there for them. Uh, nothing denied them except one thing, right? And what happened? You remember the story? Class? What happened? They wanted the one thing they, they were told they couldn't have. Everything is there for them. It's good, God says, very good. There, there's no shame. There's no hiding. There's no death or dying and disease. They're in relationship with their creator and each other. But there's just one thing for their protection. God says you must not have, and that's the one thing they have to have. Are we different? We all live with this feeling, this sense that something that we have to have is just beyond our reach. Just out of reach. Let me give you three questions to ask about your level of contentment, and we ju we'll jump back into the text. Three questions to ask about your level of contentment. How much time do you spend complaining about your circumstances? Nobody, I don't hear much of that today during the pandemic. People, I've, it's remarkable. Nobody complains anymore. <laughs> Certainly not on social media. Have you noticed this? There's, there's just a glaring lack of complaining. How much time do you spend coveting? Looking at what somebody else has and wishing it was yours. How much time do you spend comparing? Looking at somebody else's life and weighing it against your life. My son Ben, my youngest son, uh, bought a new truck. Well, I say bought, he bought it for my, my dad who doesn't need it anymore. He got a, he got a sweet deal. Um, and, you know, he's, he drives it to work and uh, he's in, it's a nice red Ford F-150. And he thinks it's the greatest thing for a while. But I noticed something about uh, the experience of owning your own truck. You start to look at other trucks constantly. You start to text your father about these trucks, <laughs> meaning me. I'm like, you have a truck. It's nicer than the car I'm driving, you know. But you, like, what if I got this grill? What if I got this lift kit? What if I got this truck? What if I got new tires? What if, what if? It's, it's natural. It's just in us to want what's next, to want something different. So let's ask this question then. How do we find contentment? That's really Paul's point. How do we find contentment? Well, in verse 12, and we'll leave this verse up here for a little bit, you'll notice that Paul says something that's really, it's easy to miss, but it's really important for us. In verse 12, Paul says, I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound in any and every circumstances. I have, what? Learned the secret. Learned. That's a really important word. To learn something means prior to learning it, you what? You didn't know it. It's a, and the Greek word means an aorist tense, meaning it's, it's on, it was an ongoing, long process, meaning it didn't just come like an aha moment, like a revelation that hit him in the head from the sky. It, he learned this through trial and error, through a life spent walking with Jesus. That gives me hope, because I still have to learn some things. I'm still in process. Maybe you are as well. It's a process over time. Remember, Paul knew about hardship. He knew what it was like to have difficulty in his life. Let me go back to... First, Second Corinthians, excuse me, chapter 11. This won't be on the screen, but it is in your Bible. Verses 23 through 28, Paul writes these words about his experience of hardship. Five times I received at the hands of the Jews 40 lashes, less one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times shipwrecked. At night and a day adrift at sea, one freak on frequent journeys, in danger from rivers, danger from robbers, danger from my own people, danger from Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger at sea, danger from false brothers, in toil and hardship through many a sleepless night, in hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure. Yeesh. Paul's middle name should have been danger. He's saying, I know what it's like to be in difficult times. I know what it's like to, to struggle. And it's in this kind of pursuit of Christ in the midst of pain and difficulty and oppression and, and you know, opposition, I've learned something. God's taught me something. Then he says, which I, I, I think it's easy for us to miss. I missed it. He says, I have learned the secret in plenty and in want, in abundance and lacking. Wait, what? Why would you need to learn how to be content in times of abundance. I mean, it totally makes sense to me that you have to learn contentment when you're in the middle of, of starvation or lack or oppression, but why would you need to learn contentment when you have it all? 
But Paul says both. Why would he say that? What does he mean? Because he knows that when it comes to money and things and possessions and comforts, having more makes you want more. Most often. A famous quote by John D. Rockefeller. At the peak of his wealth, the uh, economists estimate that he had over 1% of the entire U.S. gross economy. Estimated $250 billion in today's dollars. Ask the question, how much money is enough? Do you know what he said, his famous line? Just a little bit more. Just a little bit more. Do you know there's only one of the Ten Commandments that's repeated? Do you know which one it is? Thou shalt not covet. All the others just stated, they move on. That one's repeated and explained. Your neighbor's donkey, which is very relevant for us. And some of you have donkey envy, right? He's, but his point is, like, we need, this one's repeated because we need to get this one. Proverbs chapter 30, verses 7 through 9. Two things I ask of you. Deny them not to me before I die. <clears throat> Solomon here saying, two things I'm asking of God. Number one, remove far from me falsehood and lying. Okay, that's, I get that. Make me an honest person, Lord. Number two, give me neither poverty nor riches. That's number two on your list? Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with the food that is needful for me, lest I be full and deny you. And say, who is the Lord? Ecclesiastes 5.12, sweet is sleep of a laborer, whether he eats little or much, but the full stomach of the rich will not let him sleep. I think there's just a truth here. Paul's saying, and in fact, you could translate this, I have learned how to be content with having too, more than enough. I've learned how to cope with having too much. I remember meeting with a young man who was part of our church years ago who uh, we got together for coffee and he said, listen, uh, here's something you should know about me. I make way too much money for someone my age. <laughs> I've never heard that before. Okay. Well, let's trade spots. I- I'll take your problems, you can take mine. Right? <laughs> Lord, bless me with this problem of contentment. But Paul understands. And I, honestly, I think for those of us, we don't think of this way ourselves because we're in the comparison game. But in the world's economy, which do we need more? Contentment for being in lack or in plenty. It's easy to think, well, I lack things. Actually, that's a sign you're discontented. On the world stage, we are those that are living in abundance. Extravagant abundance. How many of you have two cars? How many own two cars? Show of hands. How many own more than two cars? There's four vehicles in my house that I'm paying for, or have paid for and paid insurance for. I don't think about that. That's... That's unthinkable in human history and in the world's economy. And yet, I find a lot of my day complaining, coveting, comparing, thinking about what I don't have. Okay. Contentment doesn't just magically happen. You have to work at it. You have to learn it. It's something that's it's a process, and that gives me hope. No child that I'm aware of has ever in human history walked into a toy store with their parents and said, you know, Mom and Dad, as beautiful as these are, I really have a whole room full of toys that I don't even play with, and you've wasted so much money. Don't Please don't waste any more of your hard-earned money on no toys. Has that ever happened? I'm not aware of any child ever who said that. Maybe the one child here, you can tell me afterwards. Let's look back at verse 12 again, a closer look at what Paul is really saying here. Uh, because everyone knows verse 13, but verse 12 gives us the context and the meaning of verse 13. Paul said he's, that he's learned what? What has he learned? Learned the secret. Ooh, Paul, please let us in on the secret. Tell me the secret. You know the secret? I want to know the secret. Whisper to my ear, Paul. We write books called The Secret. We have shows about the secret. Everybody wants to know the secret. But it's really not a secret. It's something that he's, he's gained through experience. The Greek word for secret is the word mueo. And it, it's actually a, a word that was used in the uh, Eastern mystery cults of Paul's day. It literally means to initiate or to instruct. So you've been through the initiation. You've been instructed. You're in, on the inside now of the knowledge. Paul's saying, literally, I have been initiated into something. But not by some secret ceremony. Through a life walking with Christ. I've been instructed. I've learned something. He's taking this concept and kind of flipping it on its head, which he does in a couple of places here. He says he learned the secret of getting out of that cycle of perpetually feeling like you lack. What it truly means to be content. In verse 11, the Greek word for contentment is the word autarkes. And it literally translates to sufficiency in yourself. The the Stoics of Paul's day, the Greek philosophers, the Stoics, was the most influential school of Greek philosophy during Paul's time. And they, autarkes, 
the Greek word, was a concept that they thought was the highest virtue for human life. To find within yourself the resources you need to deal with whatever life brings. Self-sufficiency. That's the highest virtue of human life. To be sufficient in yourself. To look within. And this, by the way, is a very relevant, we don't call it stoicism today, but do you ever drive by and see a yard sign that says, you are enough? Anybody seen those? I've seen those. Actually, the Bible would say, no, you're not. I understand the sentiment, wanting people to be self-assured and and not feel shame or like they lack. But from the biblical perspective, the key that's the secret to self-sufficiency is to realize you're not self-sufficient. You're not sufficient in yourself. That's what we have to learn. That's part of the secret. Socrates, one of the most famous uh, Stoic philosophers, says he is richest who is content with the least, for contentment is the wealth of nature. And Seneca, Seneca, by the way, was the mentor to Emperor Nero, who was the Roman Caesar during Paul's time and be the one to have Paul beheaded. And by the way, Nero, the student of Seneca, the, the Stoic philosopher, actually had his old, t- men, his old tutor, Seneca, uh, commit suicide. So he apparently didn't learn the lesson of contentment from his, his teacher. He's, he writes, the truly happy man is content with his present lot, no matter what it is, and reconciled to his circumstances. So Paul is using Stoicism language to, to undermine Stoic philosophy. For the, contri- for the Christian, contentment is not self-sufficiency. It's not looking within yourself. The secret of self-sufficiency is to recognize that I, there's only one who's sufficient, and it's not me. Turns out the secret has a name. His name is Jesus, Christ, the all-sufficient one. This is the context in which Paul says, I can do all things through him who gives me strength. Think about that. The real power in this verse is not, I can can become heavyweight champion of the world. I can accomplish all my goals. I can win the title. I can get the job. I can do the things that I want to do. The real power in the passage is whether I win or get knocked out, whether I lose the job and I face uncertainty, whatever comes, I have an all-sufficient Savior. His name is Jesus. In verses 10 and verse 14, Paul says that he's grateful for the concern and the kindness and the care and the provision of the, of the Philippians, but he's not dependent on them. He doesn't need them because he has Christ. He's grateful. He'll receive their help, but it's not his contentment doesn't come from that, those relationships. Unlike a feeling that just comes and goes, you know, that Contentment is something you can have in all situations. I, I shared this story on, on a little Instagram post this week, but this past week I went and met with my pastor's cohort. I've, we haven't met during uh, COVID, during the pandemic, uh, but we usually get together a couple times a year, and we met at one of our uh, locations. Uh, the church is, is in San Diego. I was very grateful to God that one of the guys in the cohort lives in San Diego. We went there, and uh, I wasn't sure how flying would be, you know, but uh, we got there, and uh, we prayed together, we studied together, we learned together, we process the things that we're being challenged with as pastors, and we try to have some fun together. So a few of us decided to try surfing. Um, I, I, one of them is a surfer. The other, the other three of us that went, got up early and went. I, they had, I was the only guy, I was never on a surfboard in my life. I was, <laughs> I'm not sure you could call what I did surfing, actually. I paid money to rent a wetsuit and a board to get just pummeled by waves for two hours. That's what I did. I got to my feet once or twice, but it was most of the time I spent trying to find the surface and find my surfboard. I didn't realize how hard it is just to get past, anybody ever surf in here? I didn't realize how hard it is just to get past the waves, just to get out past where they break. It's exhausting. You have to paddle like crazy. Three or four times I got flipped upside down. When I finally got out there, I just wanted to lay on the board where it was kind of calm. And at one point I was tired of trying, so I just sat on the board just watching the waves, and a pot of dolphins came by. One of them leapt out of the water, not far from me, maybe to me to the back of the room. I'm like, this is way better than surfing. And in that little moment... I didn't have any deadlines to meet, any stress. I just had a little moment of what I would call human contentment. Ah. Now, moments ago, I was getting pounded by the waves, right? But in that little moment, that's how we think of contentment. That's not what Paul's saying. Those little fleeting moments of joy that come and go. He's saying even when you're being churned up and flipped upside down and you don't know which way is up, you can have an all-sufficient Savior. That's the secret, he says, knowing him. Okay, three quick things, and we'll wrap up here because we've got to... We want to close by coming to the Lord's table. Three quick things, but Paul finishes at the end of this chapter 
that really, because contentment is, is active, it's not passive. Contentment is not just sitting back waiting for God to magically make you feel better. There's something we do to engage in this. First, service in his kingdom. Service in his kingdom. Christ is the king that we serve, and contentment is seeking him and seeking to serve him. Look at verses 15 and 16. Uh, in your Bibles in, uh, on the screen, Paul says, And you Philippians, you yourselves know that in the beginning of the gospel, when I left Macedonia, no church entered into partnership with me in giving and receiving except you only. Even in Thessalonica, you sent me help for my needs once and again. In chapter 1, verse 5, Paul calls them partners in the gospel. I thank my God for your partnership in the gospel. Here again, at the end of the letter, he's referring to that very relationship. We're partners in the gospel. Paul's whole life was in, seen in this context. I serve Christ for the sake of his gospel. So we say in the beginning of the gospel, my service, his contentment. In other words, in the words of the immortal theologian Bob Dylan, right? You, you got to serve somebody. If you spend your life serving yourself, you'll never know the joy and the contentment that comes from serving Christ, the all-sufficient King and Savior. Second, seeking his supply. Jesus will supply all that is needed for those who serve him and his kingdom. In 2 Corinthians chapter 9, Paul says, And God is able to make all grace abound to you at all times, having all sufficiency, so that in all things you'll have what you need. Look at verses 17 and 18. We move on. Paul says in verse 17, Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that increases to your credit. I have received full payment and more. I am well supplied, having received from Paphroditus the gifts you sent, a fragrant offering, a sacrifice acceptable and pleasing to God. What's he saying? You've given me gifts, Philippians. I don't seek the gifts themselves, but the fruit, the gospel fruit, the kingdom fruit that comes from them. And I'm well supplied by what you sent. Paul sees this as God's timing, his supply. God knows what Paul needs. And they were prevented for a time from, uh, from supplying his need. We don't know why. They didn't have a good messenger. They couldn't get there. Didn't know where Paul was. We don't know the circumstances. Paul sees it all as part of God's plan. I've received what God intended from you. Seeking his supply. Who's your supply? I like fountain pens. I, I'm, a, I'm a bit of a pen snob, my wife calls me. I can't even bring myself to look at a ballpoint pen, to be frank with you. It's beneath me, right? I write all things with fountain pens. I was given one by a professor when I was in college, and I have a collection of them. It's a bit, it's a bit nerdy, uh, but I only use fountain pens. And so um, I, I had I broken or bent the nib, my favorite fountain pen. I was talking to a guy who also is a fountain pen, uh, has an obsession problem like I do. And he says, oh, don't worry about that. I know a guy. I'm like, you know a guy. <laughs> Who knows a guy that knows how to fix fountain pens? He goes, I know a guy. It's a sense in which I think Paul's saying, I know a guy. I know a guy. I know it looks like my life is in, in turmoil. I know it looks like I'm, I'm in chains, but I know a guy who's supplying all my needs. You know a guy? His name is Jesus. Seeking his supply. And last, surrender to his sovereignty. The Philippians renewed their concern for Paul. They were concerned, but they had no opportunity. We don't know the circumstances, but again, Paul sees it all in, his, in God's sovereign control over the situation. Let me read verses 19 and 20. And my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches in, in glory in Christ Jesus. To our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. And my God will supply every need of yours, Paul says. He's sovereign. It's about his glory. And his purpose, he will supply according to his riches in Christ Jesus. And friends, this is available to you now. Not once you get that job, not once you get your debt paid off, not once you get you know, the situation with your kids launched, not once you get this relationship reconciled, not when you get there, but now. Contentment, biblically speaking, is not a destination that you someday arrive at. It's a mode of travel through life with Jesus. It's a way of being with him. Whatever comes. We think it's a destination if I get there. Paul's saying, no, it's available to you right now because he's all sufficient. And as we're two days from an election and many in our country, many in this room, wringing our hands over what's going to happen, over how it's going to go, you can have contentment in Christ regardless of how it goes. We need this. We so need this as the church, as his people. Let me close with this story. This is an apocryphal story. It's not in the Bible. It's a legendary story about an interaction with the Apostle Paul. 
passed down to us through some of the like, third century writings. A wealthy merchant during Paul's day had learned about the apostle and become so fascinated with him that he wanted to visit him. So in passing through Rome, he got in touch with Timothy and arranged an interview with Paul the prisoner. Stepping inside of his cell, this merchant was surprised to find the apostle looking rather old and physically frail. But he felt at once the strength, the serenity, and the sheer magnetism of this man who relied on Christ his whole life. They talked for some time, and finally the merchant left. As he walked outside the cell, he asked Timothy, what is the secret of this man's power? I've never seen anything like it before. Did you not guess, replied Timothy? Paul is in love. The merchant looked puzzled and said, in love? Is that all? And Timothy said, that is everything. Paul's secret of contentment is his deep sense of a love of God for him in Christ. That's the secret. If you're disappointed in that secret, friends, you don't know who Jesus is. He is your all-sufficient supply. And being in love with him is what makes, makes it all okay, whatever comes. It doesn't mean we don't work for justice or care about how things go or strive for excellence in our life. But it means I can do all things, meaning in every situation, in every circumstances, I can be content and at peace and at ease knowing that I'm loved by God in Christ. What better way to celebrate the love of God in Christ than through communion? It's the symbol God has given us of his sacrificial love for us. Hopefully as you walked in, you received these elements, a little cup together with both people. If you did not, please put your hand up and one of our ushers will come to you and make sure you have those elements. Anybody missing that? Let us know, please. The scripture teaches us that what we hold in our hands are symbols of God's love and of his sacrifice. And so before we take this, let me just let you know, and we're going to pray in a moment and then take together. You don't have to be a member of Chapel Street Church. You don't have to be a regular attender of Chapel Street Church. All that matters, according to Scripture, is that you have placed your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, that you know who he is, and that you're willing to examine your own heart, Then you're welcome at his table, which lets you know the depth of his love for you. As you peel off a top layer, let me pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for your great love for us, for your mercy and grace poured out on us, for the secret of contentment is really found only in you, Jesus. It's not that we are sufficient. We are not, but you are. We thank you that you died on the cross, sacrificing your body for our sake, shedding your blood to pay our penalty, that we would know now and forever the depth of your great love. Amen. Let's take the bread together. Jesus said, this is my body, and it's given for you. Eat this in his memory. And then after they'd eaten, the Bible says Jesus poured a cup, saying, this cup is a new covenant in my blood, shed for the forgiveness of your sins. Let's drink in his memory. Amen. Let's stand together. I guess we'll have to get used to that little crinkling sound as a sound of God's love <laughs> working its way through the, through the congregation. Before the benediction, I just want to say to all of you who are, regular, uh, uh, who are regularly generous to the mission here, we're so grateful for you. You're making a huge difference whether you realize that or not, whether you give online or if you want to give in person, there are uh, receptacles in the back. We, we appreciate your generosity and uh, your participation and what God is doing in and through us as his church. Brothers and sisters, go in the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ who is able to supply all of your needs. May you find your contentment in him now and forever. Amen. Go in peace.